toolkit holders out there. So if you missed that and you have the toolkit, definitely go and watch it. And if you don't have the toolkit yet, well, I definitely recommend it. The JavaScript widgets lesson is quite fun. Anyway, guys, on to today's lesson. We cover what is a server. So we'll be talking about servers themselves and how they fit into the full stack of web development. Then we'll be having a look at web hosting services. So as you guys may know or may not know yet, web hosting services allow us to put our content on a server that's held and owned by another company, but it just means that we can get our content online more easily and it'll cover a lot of our bases. But we'll be having a look at all the different different options that we have with these host providers uh, when we get to this portion of the class. And then guys, we'll be looking at XAMPP. XAMPP guys is a local server software that we can use to essentially emulate a server on our computer. And in reality, it's an actual server, but it'll only serve to your own computer, and it's particularly useful for development purposes in order to test what we've written to make sure that it works as intended. But sure, we'll get to that when we get to that portion of the class. Finally, guys, we're going to finish the class off by putting some actual content online. In fact, we'll be showing you content that's already there, but we'll get to that. Okay, so let's begin, guys, and we're going to go ahead and get started with our first topic of the day, and that is servers. So uh, give me a second, guys. I'm just going to reorganize myself here. So guys, before we talk about web servers specifically, I do want to talk about what a server itself is. So simply put, guys, a server, it's a computer on a network that provides services or resources. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, but what exactly do you need to know about servers? Well, to put it simply, guys, without servers, the internet does not exist. It sort of holds all of the information on the internet that you view through your browser. The Facebook website, for example, is held on a server. Twitter and YouTube, they are put on servers so that the world can access them. In fact, every single page on the internet that you've ever visited or plan to visit is on a server somewhere. So for us as web developers, it's of course extremely important for us to know how they work because we're going to be putting everything that we ever write on one in order to have it available for users. So guys, I'm going to start things off at, with a small office example of five computers. So these computers, they've all been connected together, and that forms a network. And of course, on this network, one of the five computers happens to have a shared folder that contains files. And the other four computers on this network can access and modify these files. And that makes this computer a file server, because it's providing the service of sharing files between all of the computers on a network. And similarly, this file server could have a printer attached to it, for example, and that would make it a file and print server. And it's important to note, guys, that there isn't actually a limit to how many services any given server can provide. So, uh, what then is a web server? Web servers, they're a little bit more complicated because they need actual software installed in order to do their job. And this software, it allows them to accept requests from other computers and to set back and to send back web pages. So to have a look at the example all the way back from lesson one, in this example, somebody has entered the URL for the website facebook.com. And what happens then is that this sends a request for the Facebook website over the internet to the web server that it's on. The web server then finds the website content on its hard drives and sends it back to the browser. So guys, I have a question for you. What do you think in this case acts as the network for the server? What is the equivalent of the network in this example for this particular service of providing a web page to any user in the world? And there we go, we got people answering straight away saying the internet. Someone said the internet with a question mark, and you're absolutely correct, guys. We've got the internet. And the internet in this case is the network, and the service is the delivering of web pages. So we'll be having a look at this example in a little bit more depth later on in the class, but for now, guys, we'll keep going on with the questions. And good stuff, guys, for everyone who, uh, who typed in the internet. Okay, so now that we've defined what a server is, and as I said earlier, a server is simply a computer on a network which provides services to other computers. So uh, the different kinds of server you can have, guys, uh, are servers with a small S-E-R-V-E-R-S, -E -E and then servers with S-E-R-V-E-R-S -E -E in all capitals. So what I mean by the 
the difference between these two is that a server, small s's and ERVERS's, are just like the small computer on that local network providing files and print services to those five computers. Whereas the servers, the capital S E R V E R S, on the other hand, they are real servers and they're designed to be on 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And if they stop functioning for any reason, it is a huge problem. So to bring it back to the small office example, if that computer were to crash for some reason, for any reason, it would be a bit of a pain, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. But guys, I pose you this question. What happens if the Netflix servers went down? What happens if you're sitting at home in the evening and you're watching your uh, Netflix, you know, your TV series of the day and suddenly their servers go down? What do you guys think would happen in that scenario? There is a huge problem because there will be so many users who are put out because that server went down. And as a result, guys, servers with all capitals, they really need a lot of special elements in order to work always without failing to have backups and all of that good, interesting stuff. Uh, the little office computer that I spoke about earlier, it can really be anything. You can go down to your favorite tech store and you can buy a computer for 100 euros with Windows XP or 7 uh, or 8 or 10 uh, or Linux or, you know, Mac OS 10. You could use that as a server and that would be absolutely fine for that small office example with the five computers. However, if you're talking about Netflix, a regular office personal computer, it is not going to work. It will break down. And let me talk about why in just a moment. Oops, I misclicked here. Here we go. All right. So as well as making operating systems for home computers like uh, Windows 7 or Linux or Mac OS X, uh, IT companies, they also make operating systems for servers as well. So whether or not you need something like this, it really does go down to exactly what you need to use that server for. Uh, again, going back to the small office example with a couple of people, uh, a small inexpensive PC would be perfectly fine. But for a large business that needs to allow thousands of people to access files on a server at the same time, it's not good enough. And this is, of course, where server operating systems come in. A server operating system such as Windows Server 2012 is designed to be far more stable and robust and to handle many more incoming connections than a plain old operating system for personal use. Uh, Windows Server 2012, in fact, can allow up to 10,000 users to be logged in at once on that particular operating system. On a computer with a desktop operating system, it would actually be uh, very impossible to run 10,000 connections. In fact, I'd say it would even be hard pushed at 100 or so. It depends on the operating system, of course. Uh, web servers, they also run special server-grade software, which is extremely robust, uh, stable, and it allows them to handle the large amounts of traffic and tasks associated with a web server workload. Uh, the web server software that we will be looking at later in the lesson is the Apache web server software. Uh, you can also have special server-grade hardware, of course, and similar to server operating systems, server-grade hardware is designed to run 24-7 without breaking down. In your home computer, you might have a processor with two or four cores, and these cores handle all the calculations and data processing for your computer. On a server, however, processors will often have between six and 24 cores and be made from much higher quality graded materials. And this is to deal with the huge amount of calculations that it needs to process in a typical server workload. And they'll also have functionality built in that allows them to recover more easily from things like power outages, bugs in the operating system, and things like that. Uh, an example of a server-grade processor, and some of you guys I've spotted have already typed it into the chat box, is the Intel Xeon processor. There are also motherboards, guys. You can also get RAM, power supplies that are designed to work for a server workload. And all of these can be stacked up in a server rack. And so instead of having a single database uh, server, you'll have an entire server rack to perform that single task. 
This is all great, guys, uh, but server-grade equipment, as you can imagine, it does come with a big downside, and that is the price. Because of the amount of extra work and manufacturing that goes into server software, not to mention that there aren't that many people in the world who actually require server hardware and software, it is considerably more expensive. If you're a small or medium-sized business just starting out, the cost of proper server equipment might actually be outside of your reach, even if you are a full-on business. And this, guys, is where server hosting uh, services come in. And we'll be talking about hosting specific to websites and web applications in the next section. So the next section is web hosting. So guys, web hosting, it's the business of providing storage and access to websites on the world wide web. And before we continue with this section, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Do you bear this in mind as we continue on? Hosting can lead to unwanted advertising on your website. So bear that in mind, I'll be answered during the next section, so hopefully you'll have a for me by then, uh, although people are already asking, uh, ask, answering the question. Okay, so uh, we've talked about web hosting, and we've already said that it's an advantage for small businesses, but what are the other advantages of using web hosting rather than having your own server system? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, web hosting service, it does allow individuals and organizations to make their websites and web applications accessible via the World Wide Web by putting it on a web server. Our web hosts are companies that provide these web servers. And the main benefits, guys, of using web server hosting over buying your own equipment is that it's relatively cheap. Uh, the servers are also maintained by the hosting company, uh, which means that there is no maintenance, and you can usually expect an uptime of 99%, which makes it very reliable. It's not going to go down anytime soon. There are, of course, additional advantages and disadvantages depending on what specific hosting option you choose, however. So we will be looking at the three uh, most common types of web hosting now to, get to start things off. Uh, okay, all right, cool. So the first type of web hosting, guys, is free web hosting. You've probably heard of it before if you guys have any interest in web development. If you've ever looked to get a, a hosting service, free web hosting will pop up everywhere. The obvious benefit, guys, is, of course, that it is absolutely free. Yay, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. However, guys, the downside is that you get what you pay for. Uh, free web hosting services, they're shared with a lot of other users on a single server, and that means the space and the traffic that you're allowed is very limited. They also usually have no options for installing your own software or database on the web server, and without a database and backend code, you simply can't have things like user login, user added content, there's no way of interacting with the server. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, free web hosts, they also don't generally have any kind of technical support either, and the final downside, guys, is that free web hosts generally put ads and other unwanted pop-ups on your web pages in order for them to make money because, of course, at the end of the day, they have their own costs that they have to deal with and the best way for them to do it is by putting advertising on your website. Uh, so why exactly would you bother with free web hosting if it's got so many downsides and only a few upsides? Well, of course, it's free and that means that if you have a website that you're working on and you just want to see how it performs on a real web server, which is accessible to the world. Uh, perhaps you don't mind having ads on your website, but really, guys, you would only use free web hosting for unimportant personal services, or for family websites, or for testing purposes. You can use it to test your website as well. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next option, which is, of course, a better version in terms of the quality of what you get. So, guys, Paid shared web hosting. It's the second main type of hosting. And like free hosting, there are multiple websites on the server, but the traffic and storage limits are much higher. Paid hosting generally comes with a free domain name, or at the very least, a very cheap one, which is the custom address or URL for your website. You'll also generally find a hosting company with the software that you want to use already on their servers. And the ability to install additional software on the server, it does vary from company to company, so it's a good idea to do some research about the specific host that you want before you make the purchase. Fortunately, paid hosting services uh, generally uh, have the technical support staff behind 
who know exactly what their servers can and cannot do. So if you want to get a paid shared hosting site, they will be able to tell you exactly what, uh, what you need to know about those servers. So paid shared hosting, it's a very good option for both websites and web applications as they generally include a database as well as support for back-end coding languages. Uh, you'd be able to use these to create your very own dynamic, user-driven applications and then as your web application becomes more popular and starts to get a higher number of users on the site, you can start to think about looking into the next hosting option and that is dedicated web hosting. With dedicated web hosting, guys, you're given an entire server that is completely your own. You'll often be able to choose how much storage and processing power you will need, and you can add as many different projects as you like to that server up to some limit, and each one can have its own domain name. You're also free to install any software that you need to run your websites and your web applications within reason. Of course, you don't want to be installing virus software or anything like that, but this would include, you know, server software, databases, backend coding languages, uh, all of that stuff. Any of the options you're interested in, you have the full control of that computer. Uh, dedicated web hosting, uh, there is a downside, of course, and that is that it's the most expensive of the three that we've covered so far. And that's because you're getting the use of an entire server. If your application becomes successfully you may be, have to get another dedicated server, but the issue with that is that you may only need the additional power of more servers at peak times, which means that your paid-for servers may not even be used most of the time. Taking a real-life example, guys, let's say um, Spotify have uh, the majority of their users are generally during rush hour in the morning and in the evening when they're going to and from work, and they want to listen to music while they're on the bus or while they're walking to work or while they're in their car, and that's absolutely fine. The only issue is that means that their server load peak times are in two hours out of the 24 in a day. And if that means that they have to have an entire dedicated server, just to put a microcosm example in, uh, that means that they'd be paying for an entire web server, doubling their server costs, just to accommodate that extra two hours. And there's a the reason uh, that the next hosting option I'm about to talk to has now appeared and has been around is because of that exact peak load reason that I'm going to talk about. And this new hosting option is called Elastic Hosting. So, um, all right, so Elastic Hosting, guys, it is a hosting type where you still get the benefits of choosing your own software and the amount of projects but you only have to pay for what you actually use. And this means that you're dynamically given more and more server power and space as your websites and your web applications grow. And some typical examples of companies who offer this are Microsoft, who have a platform called Azure, and Amazon, who have Amazon Web Services. And as a, fa as a matter of fact, Show Academy happens to use AWS at the moment to host the, our website. So uh, some notable companies who use this kind of hosting are as before mentioned, not Netflix and Spotify. And it's a great option for these kinds of companies because their server traffic varies so much from hour to hour during a day. That's not to say, though, that Elastic Web Hosting isn't a good option for just the average individual user because you only have to pay for what you need. Hosting on platforms like this will cost very little if you're just running a small application and it might even compete or beat the other options on price. Uh, to give you guys a real-life example, I've actually used Elastic Hosting myself, uh, both privately when I was doing some back-end work for a mobile app company, whose name I won't mention, but the end result, guys, is that we were able to use the server from the get-go before the app was actually released, and it cost basically nothing because we were just using it for testing purposes, and then when the app was released and the user base started to go up, the service was able to expand dynamically to meet the new demand. There is, however, one a minor drawback of Elastic Hosting, and that is kind of that there's a lot of options and you kind of need to know what you're doing before you set yourself with one of these up. So uh, that is uh, worth noting as well. You guys might be thinking, what host type do I need for my project X, my project Y, my project Z? And unfortunately, guys, there's no short answer to that. You'll have to do the research yourself and to figure out exactly what kind of traffic you'll be expecting on your site, how variable this is from day to day, and so on before you make a final decision. Okay, so guys, that covers Elastic Hosting. And of course, I already kind of revealed the answer to this, but which kind of web hosting can lead 
to unwanted advertising on your website? And there we go. Everyone coming into the chat box uh, with the answer. And the answer is, yes, free web hosting. And that is absolutely correct. Free hosting is the answer. And Okay, so that covers all the different web hosting services options. For now, we're going on to the next section, which is XAP, of course. And guys, XAP is a free and open source cross-platform web server solution stack package. I know it's a lot of words in a row. However, that is what XAP defines itself as. Key notes about this is, is it is open source and free. That means you don't have to pay for it, guys. It is completely available for you to download and use at your will for both personal and commercial projects. That's absolutely fine. It's also cross-platform, and the reason it's been chosen for this course, it means that if you're on Mac, if you're on Linux, if you're on Windows, this installation will work for you. You will be able to install, download, and install XAP on your computer. And finally, guys, it's a web server solution stack package, which means that it is a bundle of software that we will need to set up a web application, and it all comes in a neat bundle. But I'll be talking about XAMP itself in just a moment. So, guys, uh, XAMP, of course, is an acronym, so I'm just going to go over exactly what the acronym means, just so that you know exactly what it is that you're getting with this package. First things first, as I mentioned, it's cross-platform. It works on all uh, desktop operating systems, so that's Mac, Windows, and Linux as well. Second of all, the A stands for Apache, and as I mentioned, Apache is a web server software, so it is designed to deal and handle a large number of user requests at any one time and to be able to logically attribute those tasks to the processor. So, very useful stuff. We don't have to know too much about it, other than the, uh, if it works, it will do its job for us. So we don't have to, and we can focus on the actual web application. The third M used to stand for MySQL, and it now stands for MariaDB. And this is the database software that we will be using. Um, it is a relational database management system, and it uses, MySQL, it uses the SQL programming language, uh, as most 99% of relational database management systems do. So we'll be looking at more detail at databases uh, in Lesson 7, so bear with us until then. But we will need this software so that we can run it on our server. Finally, the first P means uh, PHP, and PHP is the back-end coding language that we are learning for this course. PHP is particularly excellent for us because it is designed to be a back-end coding language. So it's specifically designed to do, to do this task. You can, of course, use other back-end coding languages as well. You can use them instead of or in conjunction with PHP. But for now, we're going to stick to the one language, or else I'll be throwing about 25 programming languages at you, and there'd be a bit, a little bit of little sense to that. And finally, guys, the P stands for Perl, and Perl is another back-end programming language that's very good. However, we won't be focusing on Perl in this course. Okay, guys, so first things first, how do we get XAMPP set up on our computer? The first thing you'll need to go is to go to apachefriends.org. So write that website name down, or else review the lesson when it becomes available to you, because that is the website you'll need to get to to download the XAMPP uh, modules. Alternatively, guys, you can use WAMP or MAP or LAMP if you already have them installed on your computer. For the record, WAMP is a Windows-specific version of XAMPP. MAP is a Mac OS X specific version of XAMPP, and LAMP is a Linux specific version of XAMPP. However, guys, I will be using XAMPP for the purposes of this course. I won't be doing any specific help on the other alternatives, but if that's what you've already got set up on your computer, that's absolutely fine. You're welcome to stick to them as well. It's good to stick to what you know, and there is no weakness to using uh, the specific operating system versions of XAMPP. Uh, will we get support if we use MAMP? The answer is you, of course, get support, but we won't be able to help you with the MAMP software specifically. So uh, we'll be just doing everything via XAMP instead. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on now to the installation. If you go to the ApacheFriends.org uh, website, the first thing you'll see, guys, is this page, and this is where you can download XAMP. So all you need to do, guys, is to click this button here, uh, download whichever version of XAMP is appropriate for you, whether you're using Windows or Linux, or OS 10, so you need to click this one if you're downloading for Windows, this one if you're downloading for Linux, and this one if you're downloading for OS 10. Quick note, guys, XAMPP now supports PHP 7, but we are not using PHP 7 in this course. We're sticking to PHP 5 for now. Uh, once uh, PHP 7 becomes more sort of recognized, we will be using PHP 7 instead. How resources?
resource intensive is Exxon versus WAP. There is no resource uh, intensity difference, really. They're both uh, about the exact same. In fact, running an Apache module and uh, a database module, they carry the exact same workload, uh, really. Mm, okay, cool. So we're good to go. And so basically, guys, uh, there's a couple of things I need to note at this point. First of all, I'll be showing the installation process for Windows because the majority of you guys are Windows users. However, uh, there are some differences when installing on Linux and Mac, and I will be talking about those differences as we get to those points. So the first thing I want to talk about is, if you're on Windows, you'll receive this warning. It'll say, because of activated user account control on your system, some functions of XAMP are possibly restricted. Don't worry about the warning, guys. That's absolutely fine. We just need to not install XAMP in the program file subfolder, and additionally, we still need to run XAMP as an administrator anyway, so I'll be going through the process of that uh, later. Uh, as a Mac or Linux user, you won't get this warning. However, there are still configuration things you'll need to do to give XAMP access to the appropriate folders so that it can make the appropriate changes. Right, so the next step, guys, is you can just follow the installation process until you get to this page, at which point you will need to select your installation folder for XAMP. I highly, highly, highly recommend the default installation location, uh, which is C drive uh, backslash XAMP. Uh, if you want to put it somewhere else, you can, but just be careful because it can mess with the installation. It can mess with the running of XAMP as well. Once you've uh, decided on your installation folder, you're free to just keep clicking continue until it starts the installation process. And at that point, just wait until it's completed the installation. This is the same across all operating systems, guys, so you don't have to worry too much about that. And then once the wizard is completed, it'll say that setup is finished installing XAMP on your computer. Would you like to start the control panel now? The answer is no. You want to untick that box because there's a couple more configuration options that we'll need to change before we are ready to use um, XAMP. So just click on the finish, and then now I'm going to show you in a practical way exactly how we can get XAMP to start working on our computer. A couple of notes here, guys. If you are on Windows 10, you will have to disable uh, a thing called HTTP.sys because it currently is not compatible with Apache. If you are on Windows 10, send an email to support or to your support manager, and we will help you out with that. Uh, additionally, guys, if you are running Skype, or if you have an installation of WordPress on your computer, or if you have an installation of the other apps, the WAMPs, the MAMPs, the LAMPs, those cannot be running at the same time as XAMP. So you need to make sure you quit those programs completely. And when I say completely, I mean you need to go to your task manager, you need to go and right-click on the particular um, uh, process and click on the End Task button, because otherwise Skype does, has a tendency to like to run in the background, and that's a bad thing because then your XAMP will not work. Okay, so uh, as I said, you need to make sure that Skype and WordPress and all of that stuff is not running on your computer in order to get XAMP running. And the second thing, guys, is if I go to my file explorer, and I'm going to drag this box over here, and we're going to navigate to where XAMP is installed. So uh, for us in uh, Windows, it'll be C drive XAMP. It'll be in your applications folder, guys, if you're in Mac. And it, if you're in Mac or Linux, you can just search for it in your super search tool, your Spotlight, and the Linux equivalent of Spotlight. Uh, unfortunately, Windows is not quite there yet in terms of the speed of its searchability, but never mind. So we're looking for this file. We're looking for xampcontrol.exe as a Windows user. Once we're here, we need to right-click and click on the Properties button. So if we click on the Properties button, you'll get a little window that looks like this. And then once you're here, you need to go to the Compatibility tab, and you need to check the box that says Run this program as an administrator. You need, to, Of course, this is already done for me because I've done a previous installation of XAMP, and I've already got XAMP running on this computer. But just to give you an example, you tick the box Run the program as an administrator, then you click on the Apply button, and then you click on the OK button. Guys, if you are running Linux or Mac, I can't unfortunately demonstrate this to you guys because I'm running Windows, but you need to give it file uh, uh, access to the HTDoc subfolder. You need to give it access to its own folder to make changes to the XAMP folder itself because otherwise there will be some tasks that it's unable to do. Okay, so that is the sort of setup for XAMP, and once you've done all of that, 
you can actually run the XAMPP file. So I'm going to go and click on XAMPP control. And because I've got user account control on this computer, it's asked me if I'd like to give XAMPP administrator access. The answer is yes, guys. So I've got XAMPP control running now. And now, guys, all I need to do is click on the start button for Apache. And I need to click on the start button for MySQL. And once these two are running, we now have a server running on our computer. So you can give yourself a pat on the back if you get here successfully. If there are any errors, you will see the errors here and you can work through them guys, troubleshoot, ask your support manager, search on the internet, any of the errors that appear here, you can work through it and figure it out. Depending on what system you're on, depending on Mac or Linux, you will come across some issues, particularly because Apache uses port 80, which is a very popular port to use. Unfortunately, but the upside, of course, is that it's the default port for accessing local hosts. So I'm going to show you guys that now in just a moment. Just having a quick thing to make sure I didn't miss anything. There's one more thing, guys. If you have an antivirus running, you will receive a warning about it when you install XAMPP. Just make sure, guys, that XAMPP has firewall access through your antivirus. And additionally, that antivirus has marked XAMPP as a safe uh, software to use. Because it is safe, guys. I can back it up. It's open source and free to use. Uh, most open source projects are quite good things to have. Okay, so uh, now that we've got our XAMPP all ready to go and I run the XAMPP, uh, what I get is a little uh, XAMPP control that looks like this. And once my two, my Apache and my MySQL are running, all I need to do now, guys, is open a new window. And one second while I quickly, there we go, perfect. And now, guys, all I need to do is navigate to localhost, and I've got my XAMPP running. So if you type localhost into your browser, press enter, and you get this dashboard appearing here, it means that you successfully installed XAMPP. So good job, guys. You're ready to go for the next step. Uh, we will be talking about this particular dashboard as well as PHP My Admin in later lessons, but for now, guys, we're in good shape with this. So what I'm actually going to do instead is show you how you can get a piece of software running on the XAMPP server before we continue on to the final portion of the lesson. So if I open up my file explorer here, and what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to navigate to my web development folder, and I'm going to find something interesting to demonstrate to you guys. So let's see. What am I going to show you guys? I might show you guys this. So let's go ahead and copy this. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to put it. This is already a pre-prepared document, but where we need to put it in order to run it inside this htdocs folder. So uh, do bear that in mind, guys. Any server, so if you want to run a website through your server, you have to put it inside htdocs. And more than that, you'll have to create a folder for that particular file. And I'm going to name this folder, XAMPP Demo. And then I'm going to press Enter. And I'm going to paste it in here. And now I've got my files running on this particular XAMPP, uh, XAMPP server. So to run that file, guys, I need to go localhost forward slash the name of the folder, XAMPP demo is the name of the folder for me, and then I need to name the file I want to run, object 2.0.html in my case. So if I press enter here, guys, and you get this lovely website appearing. So this, guys, is running through the server. It's not running from the file system. A key difference that I'll be referring back to later. But this is pretty interesting, guys. I made this as part of a programming fundamental side course, uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, you can update me, you can go, you know, Toyota, Toyota, uh, Yaris, uh, year is 1999, seats are 5, update me, and you got, I'm a Toyota Yaris, I'm 17 years old, and I'm a medium-sized car, so there you go. Anyway, this is uh, just an example of how to add XAMPP to run a file on your computer. It looks like we're in good shape, guys. So that's how you can run a file from your server, and that's very important because when we start to run PHP files in a later class, they have to be run from a server or else they won't work properly. All right, so summary, guys. We covered what a server is. We covered web hosting services. And then we introduced XAMPP, which is going to be our local environment for testing our PHP files later on in the course. And then, with guys, we finished off with putting content onto GoDaddy website uh, with, our, uh, with our upload process. So, guys, we're now set up to put content online. As